Okay, we're back here live at the Fluent Conference in San Francisco, California. This is day two of theCUBE, Silicon Angle's uh, exclusive coverage of the O'Reilly Media Fluent Conference. I'm John Furrier, the founder of Silicon Angle. I'm joined with Jeff Frick, my co-host today. And our next guest is er Eric Elliott, JavaScript author of Programming JavaScript Applications, who also works at Adobe Systems. Welcome to theCUBE. Thanks, I'm glad to be here. So obviously, uh, we had just had Roger McGullis on, he's like, a couple years ago, he said, oh, JavaScript's gonna be really, really important. Good call, I mean, JavaScript isn't going anywhere. Um, no. It's only have a bright <laughs> future. It has some baggage, it has some legacy, but it has a, a big opportunity and big promise. So, so first, I want to get your take, being the author and, and uh, on the web app side here, uh, Fluent, what's your take on the current situation? Obviously, JavaScript's getting, you know, obviously it's there, it's validated, but it's got a lot more headroom and a lot more things to do. What is the, what is the, the roadmap look like to you? Um, well, I think where we're coming from is, is really, an interesting trajectory. Um, I think just a couple of years ago, things were were stabilizing a little bit, and then suddenly everybody started doing all kinds of crazy things with modules and AMD, and and then that kind of shook a lot of things up. Um, and I think that we're trying to get all, a lot of that standardized into the specification, so there aren't all these competing formats anymore. Uh, and I think that that standardization effort is really important. Um, and I'm excited to see that happening. So uh, I'm, I'm really excited about that. I'm also really excited about the, just the added capabilities, especially in mobile, um, WebGL, that kind of stuff. I think all of that is, is really terrific for JavaScript because once we go there, there's, there's no place we can't go, right? So JavaScript has always been looked at as you know, a web format, obviously build a web page, web design, and then obviously now it's evolved into a full-blown software engineering uh, industry, right? You have a lot of development, serious developers now, as well as newbies coming into the into the fold. Um, what what's happening? I mean, obviously we're hearing a lot of tooling going on. You're just looking at people talking about standards, web sockets. The conversation we're hearing more and more about. Not much here, but you know, you got Node.js. You're seeing a lot more things happening. Server, you know, you know, getting into the server side, getting into the database side. Did this catch you off guard? Did you see this coming? Um, what was your, what's your take on this migration up and creating a stack around around it? So first, I think that some of the things that caught me off guard that, that I wasn't expecting was just how much tooling we're capable of doing with JavaScript. Um, for instance, uh, I've been told for years and years that we just can't do the really cool tooling without the static types and things like that in other languages. And then along comes turn JS, and <laughs> suddenly our our editors are able to give us some deep insights about what is going on in our code, and that was unexpected for me. I was like, you know, I just thought we'd have to rely on our unit tests and think, and you know, just trace through the code and figure out what's going on, but now we have really good uh, ability to track where variables are coming from, how they flow through the programs. Um, so I think that surprised me. The advancements in Chrome's dev tools are just stunning, really amazing. Um, so I think that is really encouraging. There's a project called Brackets that Adobe is working on. Um, and they've got some really cool going, things going on with that. And I can't wait for that stuff to stabilize. Uh, it's an open source editor that's really nice. Um, so. I think it, as far as tooling is concerned, things have gone really, really well, really well. I didn't expect that. Um, and the so REST API, which are, and so, so you know, let's talk about standardization. That's something that everyone's been talking about and wants, right? So it's kind of a breath of fresh air there. But you know, the API and the REST APIs is a huge breath of fresh air. Now you have some standardizations, at least an API kind of model going on. Is that? You yeah. feel the same way about that, or I, I really do. In fact, there was a really encouraging talk here, uh, I think yesterday, um, uh, specifically about that, uh, how to how to create better RESTful APIs that are that are more RESTful, where you can really discover the API is more self-documenting. You can discover links to other API resources, um, and I think that that that's a, a really great thing. And what. I, the hypermedia aspect of that it's going to really, is really enable gonna change more, things. more expansion but and that's positive but i want to ask you about something that i'm hearing uh, a lot about here angular js what is what's going on with that how does that fit into the picture here 
I think I'm the wrong person to ask about Angular. Okay. I, I actually don't have a lot of experience with it myself. I, What's the buzz? I mean, I'm, I'm, I don't know much about it at all. So the buzz is that um, it can do a lot of things for you. Uh, it makes a lot of decisions for you, which means that you don't have to necessarily implement everything yourself, uh, which is not the case with uh, things like Backbone, where Backbone just gives you like these basic methods of separating concerns, and then you're expected to do everything else and wire everything up. Um, whereas Angular, you mix some stuff into your tags, and it wires up your data bindings for you and, and does a lot of magic behind the scenes, uh, which means that you write less code. Uh, at, at least that's the <laughs> theory. That's the theory. That's the hope. <laughs> that's the dream. Um, yeah, that's the dream. <laughs> so, uh, and I think they're doing cool things, and I hope that we can take some of those cool things and, and apply them in other areas. Um, so I wish them all the best. Um, I'm not using it myself, but hopefully I'll get to play with it a little bit more in the future. So awesome. Eric, talk a little bit. You're at Adobe now, right? And, and that's right. I used to buy uh, before it was Creative Suite. You know, got got my PageMaker and, and all those things, and boxes full of discs. Mm -hmm. And then we got boxes full of CDs. And you know, recently Adobe announced they're not shipping boxes of anything for Creative yeah. Suite. You know, what's kind of the vibe there? I mean, is the power of the online tools now such that, you know, they can cast off what has been, you know, disk after disk after disk load of pretty heavy lifting software, at least from the consumer side? So I think that that's a really exciting question. Um, I've been building web apps pretty much exclusively for several years now. Um, and I'm really excited about software as a service and um, subscription based models. And, and I'm I'm really excited about the, the kinds of value that we can deliver to our customers using that model. Um, so I'm, I'm really thrilled about the decision. I think that when people start using the Creative Suite tools or, or the Creative Cloud tools and they start to get used to having all those additional cloud enabled features, um, they're going to wonder how they ever got along without it, honestly. Um, and I think as we progress and mature the, the platform, um, that's going to become more and more apparent. And, and honestly, I think it's a more affordable model for a lot of people than having to save up your money and right, pony up right, $700 okay. right, for a single a of piece of software. But it was also pretty heavy lifting computational stuff for, for you know, people that aren't doing you know, hardcore things at, at the enterprise. It, and, it is. And to be able to do those in a browser, it's pretty spectacular. So a lot of that stuff is, is you actually download the apps still. They still run on your desktop. Okay. Um, there are some apps that run entirely in the cloud, um, and, and you go to the website to use those those apps. But um, most of the creative, most of the creative cloud suite right now is all um, it's all desktop apps, and we give you a really great download tool to download them. But then they also have additional capabilities that you didn't have before, like the ability to easily collaborate with people, um, people in different countries, people on different teams, um, sharing media files and resources and seeing updates in real time. And, and things like that are just capabilities that we couldn't have easily put into the desktop app without the Creative Cloud pl platform. So I mean, it's really exciting stuff. Great, have to get that one. What's going on at Adobe? Obviously, Adobe is no stranger to user experience and user interface. So, I want to get your take, just kind of like as a as a developer, we're looking at the landscape. There's still the eye on the prize. The prize is user experience and user expectation, and that's up in the air. You got some tech trends that are driving it. Technology, you mentioned tooling and platform, general purpose stuff, and uh, the APIs and RESTful APIs as a platform. Uh, and that's going to go into the data center. It's going to drive all kinds of infrastructure. Velocity will cover all that stuff. But still, you got to develop a great user experience. We we are Scoot here. We're doing changing the game on scooters by <laughs> embedding some stuff to some some user experience. And so the user expectations are changing. Yeah. How do you you know how do you guys at Adobe and how do you guys talk about that internally? You got to do new things. You got to be you know innovating. What's your thoughts on the changing expectation? So internally, this is really a technology story. We have the capability now of of looking at how our users are, are using the apps and um, being able to react quickly to those changes, especially since we went into the Creative Cloud. Um, we're point. able to respond a lot faster. We're, we're, we're able to patch the software a lot faster. Um, with the subscription model, you don't wait two or three years to upgrade your app. Um, 
if there's a user experience issue, we fix it and we fix it fast. Uh, and I think that that's a game changer for Adobe. And I think that our ability to create mind-blowing user, user experiences uh, has been exponentially grown. How about let's talk about development processes. So you know, so you go back to you know when I was a, a lad, software development techniques were pretty linear. You know, waterfalls. Now it's like agile has been great as a methodology, but agile has been synonymous when you add cloud onto it. It's just push code and fix it when it breaks. Kind of taking out the <laughs> QA side of it or crowdsource QA. You can do that on the web. The web is you know you can you manage that. But mobile now is blending. It's now a web experience. It's not just mobile anymore. Can Agile work on mobile? We were debating that on Androids getting updates every day. Apple's a little bit more closed than, say, the Android. So maybe you can update your stuff in code at more Agile and, say, Android than Apple. But does Agile programming kind of fit the, the mobile model? I mean, web, it's no problem. So you can do it more methodology, method um, cleaner on the UA, QA side, or push it and break stuff, like Mark Zuckerberg would say, and then fix it fast. Mobile's harder, depending upon platforms. So what's your take on that as a, as a developer? So my take is that mobile is, I think in the future, right now a lot of people are doing um, native apps, and, and a lot of people believe that native apps are the way to go. Um, but I think in the future, you're going to see that all of that software lives in the cloud, and we can update it. Uh, just like we update the web. And uh, I think that that's really the direction that things are going to go in that space. Uh, and I know Adobe certainly can't just push things to the cloud and, and fix it if it breaks. Uh, we have a rigorous testing cycle. And we have <laughs> I wasn't suggesting that. I wasn't we have a, yeah, we have a well, lot of. You guys of are software, I mean, from a prepackaged software standpoint, there's a lot of DNA at Adobe, so I'm sure that's what yeah. you know. But the web guys you talk to, it's like, oh, it's throw out some stuff, and I mean, nothing really breaks the whole site, but mobile could. So we were debating kind of the, for the young startups can Agile work in, in mobile? I think that it can, and I've seen it work in, in some companies. Uh, the, obviously, the sprints are a little bit longer because there's, in some cases, you push a release to your mobile app store, and then it has to get cleared, and that process takes who knows how long. Um, but, uh, and then once, once it gets out there, it's kind of fixed there at that point for that whole cycle again. So you've got to be careful about what you're pushing to mobile. Goes back down to discipline. That's yes, yeah, that's your right. Point. Yes, right. it really. You still got to have. You got to have QA. You definitely need that <laughs> QA process, and I think that that QA process is really critical. And I think one way that you can ensure that is to concentrate more on building better unit tests and better integration tests, and to automate more of your testing process, and to really make that a, a critical part of your process, and don't squeeze it out like. Whatever you've got that's ready to go, that's what you push to production, right? You don't, you don't like try to squeeze everything into your release and then squeeze out the time for testing. Um, I, I really think it's essential to give testing the time that it deserves so that you really have a great product when you push. So, uh, Eric, talk a little bit about kind of the rise of the citizen developer, and, and we, we hear about that a lot. Obviously, developers are getting a lot more face time. You know, your role is much more pronounced. But talk about how these tools and, and the uh, kind of maturation of the infrastructure is enabling people that haven't been coding for a long, long time to start to actually code and make contributions. So I think that the bar for entry has like dramatically lowered. Um, everything that you need to, to create great code and, and push code to production is available for free. Um, there's, everything's open source. Uh, you know, a, a lot of tooling, every, every bit of tooling that you need to produce a great app is just out there available for free, oftentimes installed on the devices that you care about. Um, so I think it's, I think that that is really great and the fact that there, there are really great tools is really great. I think that there's still a little bit of an education problem, especially in JavaScript. Um, a lot of people are using JavaScript as an educational platform now, like Khan Academy, um, Code Academy, uh, and I think that that's tremendous. That's a really good change. Um, but then, even among the more experienced JavaScript developers, there are misunderstandings about the nature of the language and how to use it, utilize it most effectively. And um, so I think there's still a big education story to tell there. Okay. 
Well, obviously, we're here at the Fluent Conference. We're getting all the load down. Final question for you. What's next for the JavaScript community? Obviously, jQuery has some, you know, some history as well, and that's been talked about here. We've got Angular, got all these new things. Very exciting new stuff happening. The developers want to know what's going on that's relevant, and, and just share your perspective of the Fluent Conference in context of the developers out there watching. What's, what's, what's the headroom? What are the things to watch? What are the things to, to think about and focus on? So some of the things that I think are really cool that, that, that are coming just around the corner is um, you're going to see real-time updates as you're writing your code. You're going to see your code updating in real time inside the running JavaScript engine on Node in the browsers. Uh, we're seeing demos of that stuff coming out right now, and that's, that's really, really cool, really powerful stuff. Um, so I think the development process is going gonna, is gonna to be much, much smoother. You don't have to like, do the whole edit, save, refresh, you know, restart your server kind of thing that, that we're used to doing. Um, so I think that that's going to be really cool. There's also just the, the capabilities that are coming along, especially on the mobile frontier, um, like those, those things that, are, that, that JavaScript can't do in mobile right now. They're, they're dropping like flies, which is fantastic. Um, so I think that... Performance obviously is big in the mobile <clears throat> environment. Yeah, it is. And performance in JavaScript, that's a really great story too. I, I mean, it's come a long way. I mean, now we're, we're at the point where there's like, I think uh, Brendan Ike said it was like 1.3x uh, native C code performance with Asm.js, which is just stunning. I never would have thought that we could get that low and it's going lower. So I mean, that the differential between native apps and JavaScript apps is disappearing, yeah. Yeah. Uh, which. Mean, gotta, gotta be there. Eric Elliott from Adobe wrote a book about uh, JavaScript app development and knows the ins and outs of it. Got to study up on Angular. Check out Angular, I know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> good good commentary on the buzz. Assignment. Thanks for sharing that. We're gonna watch that. This is SiliconANGLE's exclusive coverage uh, with theCUBE, our flagship program. We go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. We'll be right back with our next guest to wrap up day two here, our final day at uh, Fluent Conference. We'll be right back after this short break. The Cube is this conceptual box, if you will, and we bring people inside of the Cube and then we share ideas, but those ideas don't stay inside the Cube. We explode that idea. We allow that idea to grow and grow, and it does. So we really try to own the whole enterprise technology space. I mean, that's what we're all about. We take analysis, we take publishing, we take news, and we take live TV, and we combine it together in a product and share that with our community. No one's doing what we're doing. Uh, what we're doing, in my opinion, is the future of media, the future of television, the future of the internet. Video is an amazing, powerful product. So we work in what John and I talk about as a data model. People always say to us, well, how do you guys make money? We sell knowledge, we sell information, we sell data. So the problem that we, are, that we identified is about what we call big, fast, total data. Anybody can analyze a gigabyte of data. If you do a thousand gigabytes, that's a terabyte of data. You take a thousand terabytes, that's a petabyte of data. A thousand petabytes, that's a zettabyte of data. So you are talking big data, lots and lots of data, and can you analyze it in real time as it comes in, right? The cube is like we call ESPN of tech because we want to cover technology like ESPN covers sports. John has a great vision for what's going to happen next in tech. And so John is sort of that alter ego of mine that lets me see the future. We have a really amazing team of people that work with us. 
Michael Sean Wright, Mark Hopkins, you know, we've got Kim here today. We've got a team of people on our news desk uh, run by Kristen Nicole. So she has a team that help feed us the news of the day, what's happening, the analysis. We have a team of analysts, and they feed us information about what's happening. And then, really importantly, we have a community, a big community of, of many hundreds of contributors. We love technology, we love, we love the innovation, and that's what we do. We want to create a great user experience. And in order to do that properly, you've got to really, really prepare. The Cube for the past year that we've been in operation has been very, very successful. And uh, you know, companies do pay us to come here. I think the companies who bring us in with the Cube get two things. They get a third-party independent resource to provide knowledge to their audience who are seeking it. There's demand for the, for the product. And also complements their existing media. Uh, we're here at an event and uh, you know, the, the company has their own TV organization and they have to pay a premium for that. So we complement that by offering a objective, organic, third-party, independent analysis of the event. That's why the top executives come in here. The Cube is a comfortable place. It's a place where people feel happy and are happy to share their knowledge with the world. And uh, we're happy to, to be ambassadors of, of that knowledge transfer. My entire career has been really built on relationships and talking to people and extracting knowledge from people, largely in a belly-to-belly -belly private forum. What the Cube does is it explodes that to a huge audience. I mean, we've reached millions with the Cube, and it's real time, it's live TV, so you've got to be quick on your feet, but you learn very fast, and then you iterate from that learning. So John and I play off of that, and we're constantly trying to up our game. Okay, we're back here live in San Francisco, day two of SiliconAngle.com's The Cube, our flagship program. We go out to the events to strike a signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle, and I'm joined with my co-host Jeff Frick uh, from SiliconAngle, Wikibon, and we are here to talk of video, startup, front end, a lot of challenges around rich media, obviously real time, we're talking about the developer action here at the Fluent Conference, which is put on by O'Reilly Media, wall-to-wall -wall coverage, and one of the challenges is mobile. Cloud, real time, low latency, Node.js, JavaScript, all that stuff is coming together. Great for websites, add rich media into the mix, can be even more challenging. So our next guest is Lyle Shearer, front end developer at Huddle. Uh, welcome to theCUBE. Thanks. You guys uh, obviously have a killer app that's uh, well received by sports enthusiasts, and Jeff Frick has a lot to add on this subject because you're a user, that's right, as John. well as a host of theCUBE, and a user of this guest, so I know you're, you're ecstatic about this, so I'll let you take it away. Yeah, I was excited to see the guys, they always wear their Huddle t-shirts, so I, uh, I, I grabbed them out of the, uh, the Expo Center and asked them to come on board, because I think Huddle's a really interesting story. One, it involves video, which is never an easy thing to work with online, with low latency and all the challenges that come with that. Two, you're dealing with football coaches, who A, maybe aren't the most technical savvy guys, I mean more than football coaches, but high school, a lot of high school coaches and other coaches, 
Um, and then three, kind of what, what I think is an interesting story is your guys' progression from a technological point of view in terms of, I know you started with Silverlight and all the, then all the guys started getting apples and they're all crazy. Yeah, I got an apple, I can't get Silverlight to work. And then now, as you've slowly adopted mobile and bringing more multi kind of input devices into a single system in a multi-format system where you, uh, and I'll just talk about it, you know, they, they created an app for the iPhone where you can do some of your work live at the field, you upload that, then it works in conjunction with the more uh, legacy apps that you've built, and then you work in an integrated fashion. So, I don't know, I guess it wasn't much sorry. of a question, I'm sorry, but to talk a little bit about the development challenges as, as you guys have had to change with changing technology, kind of as your customer demands have, have changed. Yeah, certainly. Um, I mean, the company really started out uh, working with the, the Huskers at UNL, and at that point it was actually just a thick client application. Um, so it wasn't really about till uh, 2008, I believe, um, that we started making the move towards the web and towards the high school market um, and just sort of adapting with the technology there. Um, and that just made it a lot easier for us to scale and to support a lot more uh, a lower cost solution for high schools that was just a, as applicable to them as, as the more expensive the client was to you know professional and college teams. Uh, so that was one real big change that really let us take off and um, gain a lot of customers, a lot of speed uh, and, and growth uh, there, really grew our support team, uh, which I think is really a pivotal part of, of our success too. You know, we have a great product, but uh, we really have world-class support. So, you know, like you said, you know, some coaches aren't the, the best, you know, using different, you know, computers and uh, different websites and, and handling technical support issues. Uh, so that's definitely been a real help, uh, you know, bridging that gap. We, you know, we have really power high-end users as well, but um, so definitely a lot to our support. But uh, yeah, as you mentioned, um, as we've grown, we had, you know, the original, just the, the basic web application, but then obviously, you know, mobile inevitably is going to become a part of this. Sure. Uh, we kind of held off for a little while, uh, and we didn't really do any uh, mobile, you know, web app type um, work for, for the longest time, um, but we basically skipped over that and just went right to native. Uh, we started with iOS and the iPad. Um, and just try to get a really great, you know, we saw that as a perfect uh, delivery mechanism for video. I mean, that's what I've had it, one of the strongest uh, features of it is video. So that just seemed like the perfect platform to really start and dive into that mobile experience. Uh, so we did that and then, of course, uh, you know, slowly moved, got, basically got a lot of experience with, with iOS and developing for iOS and um, then moved to, you know, the iPhone app. Uh, and then also in the middle there, sort of got an Android app out there, uh, which actually currently, you know, boosting and sort of getting up to speed with, with sort of our iOS devices. Um, and then more recently, we've got a, a Windows 8 app also um, out to sort of support, um, you know, an, another big missing uh, uh, platform for us. So as far as, you know, watching and, re and reviewing your video and everything for, you know, coaches and athletes, um, definitely have a lot of options and really have your video wherever, whenever. Uh, on the video upload side, then we also originally started with a Windows client to upload the video and then later got familiar with the Mac platform and had a support for native support for Mac to really, because we saw a huge percentage of coaches that were just well, demanding that. Lyle, I want to ask you about um, user experience because you guys have a product that, you know, your target audience is not so tech savvy, coaches mm -hmm. possibly, Jeff, you know what I'm talking about, um, and there's a lot of user design issues, but also some tech involved. We heard some folks earlier talk about Node, making it really fast on the latency side. How do you guys, have you identified those challenges, and what kind of opportunities do you see in that area? Yeah. Um, I mean, we're constantly, you know, the core at our core, it's delivering video. Um, it is our product, and uh, you know, there's, there's, we've been slowly trying to incorporate, you know, like HTML, HTML5 video delivery, and um, had issues with that in different areas. We still our sort of current main uh, delivery, other than the mobile apps, is with Silverlight. Um, so that does have some um, some. Limitations. Uh, we've also, you know, looked into different capabilities of, of Silverlight and other media's like the, um, I blank on the name now, but uh, being able to, you know, jump to the middle of a video clip without loading the entire thing, uh, some things like that. Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, one of the great things about, about Huddle, and you guys have a real appreciation for your customer, and, and, and football coaches, I'm just sure everyone's heard stories whether you're into it or not. I mean, the guys have no time. They work, they work, they work, their work. And the other interesting thing, right, is you can never look at too much film. You can always mm -hmm. go back through the film and look at it again. So there's this real singular focus on speed and enabling those guys to do their job faster, having concurrent tagging for multiple people, trying to get it up, now having the, the preloaded uh, tags from the app. Talk a little bit about how that kind of a design philosophy influences what you do, and then two, as you've adopted these other kind of mobile technologies, how that's enabled you to kind of rethink your application. Yep, um, so actually one of our uh, sort of themes, one of our core themes, uh, when whenever we're doing design or you know working with a new feature uh, we always sort of go back to sort of a mantra of just give me my damn video um, <laughs> and that's one that keeps ringing true because uh, that is really what coaches want is to to get their video and you know maybe some other things but at the core they really want to to watch their video they want their players to watch their video but they want to just get to the video cut through everything else and, and just get that video so that's something that's helped us uh, you know keep bringing the focus back to, to where it needs to be, not getting distracted by all these side features and, and little things, unless those help get you to your video quicker, more quickly. Um, but yeah, we definitely have sort of taken some different um, approaches or being able to experiment a little bit um, with our mobile, our, our native apps, uh, being able to sort of rethink like what is the really the most important thing uh, to experience here. So if you're using you know, the our, our web you know, huddle.com, you know, the experience is a lot different because that's, it's still sort of building on the original, uh, the original idea, whereas the, the mobile is much more streamlined as just, you know, video, just minimal infrastructure to actually get to that and just being able to skip through really easily and, you know, really data driven, being able to, you know, view plays based off different you know, stats and yeah. um, just trying to really quickly navigate the video. The navigation is phenomenal. Like I, like I said, if I had a nickel for all the hours I spent on, on Huddle, I would I would be a rich man. So I, I want to thank you for coming on. I know we just kind of grabbed you and uh, and I got excited for, uh, for for bringing you guys on because it's a great application. It's also a great story of a tech startup coming from not tech. Guy was an assistant coach. He needed a tool. He's got the tools. They built a great little tech yeah. company in out in, in the heartland. Yep, yeah. and um, have got tremendous tremendous market penetration, not only in high schools, but in colleges and also some pro teams yeah. as well. And so. great end user experience. Ultimately, the theme of the show is about user experiences, so congratulations. This is theCUBE here at O'Reilly's Fluent Conference. Tweet us, I'm at Furrier. Um, also, um, tweet us any questions, we'll address them for you. And uh, go to the hashtag Fluent Conference, Fluent Conf, C-O-N-F, and uh, we'll follow your tweets and bring you inside the theCUBE. This is theCUBE at O'Reilly Media's Fluent Conference. We'll be right back after this short break. The Cube is this conceptual box, if you will, and we bring people inside of the Cube and then we share ideas, but those ideas don't stay inside the Cube. We explode that idea. We allow that idea to grow and grow, and it does. So we really try to own the whole enterprise technology space. I mean, that's what we're all about. We take analysis, we take publishing, we take news, and we take live TV, and we combine it together in a product and share that with our community. No one's doing what we're doing. Uh, what we're doing, in my opinion, is the future of media.